saw that uh, liner right there. I think that might have been a slid off. Uh, almost killed him right there. But when he throws his fastball right and commands it, it's as good as the fastballs there is in the game. Doc, Yamamoto pitched well. What did you think of not only the start, which had the best numbers for him of the season, but how do you think his fastball plays? These guys have talked a lot about it. Uh, I, I think it, it it plays it plays the, the way it should. I, I would say, you know, it, it's one of those things where fastball quality is sort of it's everything. It's all encompassing, and I say that with velocity. Um, it's the characteristics of you know rise or spin or whatever you want to say, and also command most importantly. And I think with uh, Yoshinobu, he has all three of those things. So the most being the command. And so when his fastball is commanded, I think it plays as a plus-plus fastball. And yesterday, and we saw that uh, liner right there. I think that might have been a slid off. Uh, almost killed him right there. But when he throws his fastball right and commands it, it's as good as a fastball as there is in the game. Is there – Austin Barnes was catching yesterday. Beginning of spring training, I was watching you guys. Austin didn't even get to play in any games. I'm, I'm a big backup catcher guy, so – I don't really get to see a lot of games. I get to see a lot of bullpens and stuff like that. He didn't even play in games because he was catching a lot of Yoshinobu. Yoshinobu. And is that something, was that a plan? Did you guys then shift and say, okay, Will, you're going to catch him a lot here in spring training? Or is it going to be something that maybe Yamamoto throws to Austin Barnes? You know what, Kratia, I I think uh, it it was – it pro- probably wasn't that well thought out. Um, I do think that trying to get all of our catchers involved and getting to know each of the pitchers, uh, certainly uh, Yoshinobu, uh, was important. Um, and yesterday, I will tell you this, is that Austin did a fantastic job with the fingers and uh, catching that low bullet. And uh, he did a great job catching the low ball. He always has done. Um, but I think for me... It's really just trying to, uh, obviously, Will's our starting catcher, but giving Austin some opportunities to be consistent, to be relevant. So uh, when he does get opportunities, it's not like the first time he's ever played the game of baseball. Wait, wait, you said his his fingers were good. We have to come up with a different name for it now because they don't put down signs. They use the, they use the, uh, so... He was he was good with Fine. what the remote control like he was good with the video yeah that's game, fair that's fair he, he his index finger hitting the right button was was good he yeah was, that's fair he had good buttons yeah because catching <laughs> catching we used to say you know if, if your pitcher got whacked you'd go into the training room and ice your fingers because they weren't working right that day so well the buttons were working yesterday <laughs> the buttons were working I like that I like that. <laughs> Hey, I want to talk about something. You know, you got your big guns over there, you know, Mookie Betts, Freeman, Shohei, guys ahead. I want to talk about Teoscar Hernandez a little bit, man. This guy is banging right now. Uh, I don't think he's getting the praise that he should. He's 20 RBIs. He's helping the team do some damage, some big runs coming in, some big RBIs. Talk a little bit about him and uh, how he's just following the lead pretty much. You know what? Uh, it's interesting that you wanted to talk about Teoscar because he's a lot like you were. You know, he, he's uh, – He's a very fun-loving, positive guy. Um, good or bad, you wouldn't know any different. And uh, he's got big power. Uh, he loves to drive in a run. Uh, there's certainly some swing and miss, but man, I'll tell you, you're right. You know, to have a guy in the four, five, or six behind those three, four monsters um, is is huge. And you got to have a guy that can hunt a hunt a run, bat it in. And so uh, for me to be able to plug him in every single day, whether it be left field or right field and have that consistency of the head, the at-bat quality has been invaluable for me. And for me, getting to know him, uh, I love the the guy, I love the player, and I'm looking forward to him coming back to where it started for him in Toronto. I think he's going to have a big series. Doc, I'll mix in some fan questions while these guys do their thing. So fans are asking about Andy Pajes, how he's looked, and will he stick when Jason Hayward comes back? Um, He's looked fantastic. Um, I've had him out in center field, right field, um, and he's really shown really well in both, uh, defensively, offensively. Um, It's fun for us to see a young player come up and make an impact um, who's been a Dodger farmhand. So uh, to the last question, um, Jason is uh, a couple weeks away from getting back. He still hasn't 
really swung a bat, let alone take live at bats, let alone go out on a rehab assignment. So he's a ways away. So I think for me, it's, I'm going to, you know, let's take it uh, week to week, day to day, and then we'll see where we get when Jason comes back. But, you know, the main thing is Andy goes out there and plays well, and, you know, the world could look a lot different in two, three weeks. So we'll see. As a manager with the talent that you have on the team, you don't, you don't manage talent, so I think I'm going to know. You manage the people, so I think I know what your answer is going to be here. But what's more impressive with Shohei Otani, the top spin 119-mile-an-hour home run he put in the upper deck, or the fact that he almost has an 1,100 OPS through this month after the turmoil that he has faced and the off-field issues that he's gone through? The latter. Uh, for sure, the latter. Um you know, uh, certainly what he did hitting 119 miles an hour top spin into the upper deck is pretty remarkable. That just doesn't happen. Um, but Kratzky, I think that the turmoil that he went through, uh, signing a big deal, um, coming to a new team, and then going through all this stuff and not kind of wavering in performance uh, and showing up every day, uh, it was remarkable to see because, yeah, it's a superstar player but he's still a human being and still to be able to navigate, manage that uh, is remarkable. And I think it's a credit to him as a person. And I will say this, um, his openness to continuing to get better as a ball player, whether it be on the bases or in the batter's box and controlling the strike zone uh, has been something that really excites me because, you know, even the best players, you know, still want to be coached and need to be coached. Let me ask you this too as well. We've heard he's been open in the clubhouse as well. The culture, and I, I think that's the biggest thing as a team, bringing a team together as a culture is the biggest thing too. So talk a little about how in the clubhouse, how he's been doing too. He's been fantastic. Um, you know, now that, uh, you know, Will Ireton is the guy that sort of now uh, his kind of Swiss Army knife for us, and he's done some baseball analytics stuff, game prep, and now he's acting as uh, Shohei's interpreter and, and stuff like that. But I will say Shohei has really taken it upon himself to uh, be more independent, trying to uh, find his own way more, which I love. I'm seeing him a lot more of the players. He's more engaging with his guys, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, Yoshinobu has really uh, learned learning English. He's taken English classes three times a week, I think, to try to learn the language. So that's part of the culture. And the thing is that you were a culture guy, Kratz, you were a culture guy. And the thing is that you just certainly can't quantify it. But, you know, when you're playing baseball in every single day in a game of failure, you got to fall back on something. And that's the culture. And uh, those two guys have really assimilated well. And we got a great group of veterans that have been around for quite some time. But for me, um, it, it's fun to see those guys like each other and get along and play for one another. So who's the leader in this clubhouse? Who Who's the leader? And did you see this person as the leader when the season or the past seasons have had some turnover of of some leaders leaving and and coming back to the clubhouse you know it, it's interesting I, I think if i had to pick it's hard to say a leader which i think is a good thing when you're talking about 26 players um so i i think i i think jason hayward is certainly in that conversation i think freddie freeman is certainly in that conversation and Mookie Betts is certainly in that conversation. And they lead differently. I, I think Jason is more, and I think the one thing is they all are different. They all lead differently. But I think for me, the thing that I really respect is that they lead by example first and foremost. Um, but if Freddie's gonna say something or Mookie's gonna say something, it's like EF Hutton, you know, everyone's gonna listen. Um, but for the most part, they kind of uh, lead by example. But Jason is kind of like the godfather uh, not the Todd father, the Godfather, <laughs> as far as guys sort of respect what he does and how he goes about things. And he's the guy that's going to take care of the young players to get the buy-in and make everyone feel comfortable. Um, but Miguel Rojas is, is more boisterous and, and jovial, and, and, and he's kind of got that kind of role as well. Who's the Dodgers' biggest rival? Obviously, everybody says, oh, Dodgers Giants, Dodgers Giants. It's always that. Well, the Diamondbacks knocked you guys out last year. The Padres just had a great series against you and knocked you guys out before. Who is the biggest rival for the Dodgers? And we don't sit on both sides of the fence here, so you got to say it with your chest. One, yeah, one you know what? Other. 
Honestly, it's not even, I think that everyone likes to beat the Dodgers. Everyone loves to beat the Yankees. And, and that's, I think that's a good thing. That's a compliment, I think, to the organization, to kind of the history of it. Honestly, is I really preach, you know, we're trying to beat everybody. And I think that the fans, the media certainly loves the, the, the Giants and the Dodgers with the history of it. Certainly the Padres somewhat had some momentum, has some momentum. Uh, and the D-backs, they handed it to us last year um, in the postseason. So, I don't know. And, and I, I like playing the Braves. You know, we, we've had some battles with those guys in the postseason. And um, so I don't really see anyone as a rival. And I think I don't want to take the wind out of anybody's sail. Honestly, Kratzy, we're trying to beat everybody. And so <laughs> I don't really care who it is, where we play. So I don't really look at anyone as a rival. And it's no disrespect to any other organization, though. I want to switch gears just a little bit. <clears throat> we had Kevin Pilar on here. We know you coached him. What a great dude he was. He just got DFA'd. Uh, I want to talk, talk to you as a manager how different it is, how tough it is to you know designate a veteran guy, especially knowing how great of a person they are. But business is business as usual. It, it's uh, it's tough. I, I've had to be a part of those conversations and. KP was, uh, albeit a short period of time, but one of my favorites. And he's one of the guys that he's just done it the right way and uh, honored the game that gave him an opportunity to, to play in the big leagues for quite some time. Um, I, I use this word to some guys at breakfast today. You know, he looked at the game of baseball as a caretaker. And uh, we're all sort of caretakers for this great game. And so um, at some point, Father Time is going to get us all. And, um, you know, I don't know if this is the end of the road for KP, but, you know, I think that, you know, when he puts his head down the pillow, he can say, I gave everything to this game every single day. And um, I was fortunate enough to be to call him a teammate, albeit I coached him. But uh, I wish him well, and hopefully we'll cross paths soon. I got one more for you, Doc, and then Todd's got a big finisher that you'll like, guaranteed. <laughs> uh, Lineup-wise... How would you grade how things have gone so far? Are you surprised that the bottom of the lineup has struggled? I know you've talked a lot about, you know, Chris Taylor, and that's a guy you've coached for a while. And what do you do in a scenario like that? Um, I, I am surprised at the inconsistencies of uh, the bottom. Um, and and there, there's a group of players that are in there. Um, and so I, I think it's going to turn um, – you have to kind of continue to run guys out there, bet on them. I think for me, as you as you manage for, for longer, you're less reactive. And, and you have to be slow moving because you just can't play always the hot hand. Um, and and you got to kind of show players that you, you got them, right? You trust them. And so CT has had a lot of big hits for us uh, in, this, in the postseason and in, in years. And I've seen them a long time. And so I'm going to continue to run them out there and uh, expect it to change. I think Gavin Lux has shown some life. I think that uh, James Altman, same thing. Kike is trending in the right way. Uh, Miggy Rowe and Austin Barnes have kind of done what they can do. So I think that, you know, we just got to get Chris Taylor on track. He'll play tomorrow versus Kikuchi, which isn't going to be easy. Uh, he'll get a couple lefties in Arizona, and then hopefully we can get him on track. But he's a guy I'm going to keep betting on, and uh, <laughs> you got to trust your players. So... I remember a couple of years back, somebody dove into the stands, made this unbelievable catch. He was playing for the Mets, his third baseman. Um, he just, it was probably <laughs> one of the best catches you've ever seen. And so happens to be, there was the wrong ball in his glove. I don't know how, see that, that ball right there? That ball fell into that person's glove and it just <laughs> happened to be an out. So I want you to go back in that scenario and understand like, and outs and out, right? I mean, that's just part of baseball. <laughs> so, what a finish, man. So, you know, the first thing is when I see that player, that unnamed player, I think yeah. of Derek Jeter, my favorite player of all time. It's just <laughs> challenging out, doing whatever he can to help his team win a baseball game. And so the next place it takes me to is the head. Just thinking outside the box, the ability to read and react, and mm -hmm. so that player was certainly talented and could hit a homer with the best of them. Um, but now the, the ability to adapt, not catch the ball that was in play in his glove, 
but then to kind of adjust, see something white, rounded, and play it as his own <laughs> to capture the out and play it off like it was just another routine play and dap get dapped up by Rosario or whoever that was, yep. and yep. then go to tell the story so he gets more love from the bench coach. It's pretty <laughs> remarkable. And uh, that player, the Todd father, who is one of my favorites of all time, you just went to another level, man. Oh, man. <laughs> hey, and what people don't know, the, the next game he brought, he gave, I think it was, uh, he gave Pete Alonzo a squishy ball. You gave first base coach like a fake ball, and he rolled it to me, and I could barely squeeze, and I look in the dugout, and he's like, yeah, you son of a gun. I got you, yeah. <laughs> It made for that was good stuff, man. That Dude, good that stuff. is so good. I love that. Well, well played, man. That's not, yeah. And what a finish! I, I told the Grom too. I said you won the Cy Young because of that catch. You know what I mean? You were going, you were struggling that inning, so we we had a good laugh too as well. <laughs> Hey, dude, you saved him some pitches. You got him a decision. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. That's, a, exactly. that's a teammate. Good actor. That's why he's in broadcasting now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Doc, well great to see you, man. Thanks for swinging by. Good luck in Toronto this weekend. Have fun, all right? All right, fellas. Thanks for having me on. You know, one in five Americans have learned a new language on their bucket list, and it's been on my list, and I'm actually working on my Spanish right now. If this sounds like you, make 2024 the year you finally check it off the list with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. You know we love the word real on FT. I was recently in South America and I plan on going back after I tackle Babbel's courses that help you learn real life conversation skills in a different language. The real help you need like how to order food or ask for directions without having to consult language apps. Also, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and your accent. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at FT at babbel.com slash foul territory. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash foul territory, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash foul territory. Rules and restrictions may apply. With Babbel, you can learn everything you need to have real world conversations from vocab words to culture, and all it takes is just 10 minutes a day. Hey everybody, be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball the way it should be covered.